I'm very happy to be here, and I hope what I have to share with you today will change your life. <laughs> I'm serious about that. It has changed my life. I have been trying to figure out the answers to life's big questions for about 55 years, since I was about 13 or so. So from there, you can figure my age. <laughs> I have looked at the most important questions. And I can say they're the most important questions because these are what the House of Justice has told us are the most important questions. I'm going to read to you just one sentence from a letter they wrote November 19 in 1974 when they were written by the NSA of Italy asking, how do we address all the suffering that's in the world? Because everywhere around us, we see suffering. And today, we see suffering. And here was their answer in a very short. The letter, I, I highly encourage you to go read and study the letter. I'm going to focus on this one sentence. It says, what they desperately need is to know how to live their lives. They need to know who they are, to what purpose they exist, and how they should act towards one another. And once they know the answers to these questions, they need to be helped to gradually apply these answers to everyday behavior. It is to the solution of this basic problem of mankind that the greater part of all our energy and resources should be directed. So today, in 18 minutes, I'm going to present to you 18 concepts or constructs. I'm going to present you a model that will answer these three questions. The questions of who we are, what is our purpose, and how should we live? To do that, I'm going to start from the very beginning, where we all started. And that's right here. We all started as one-cell creatures. If you want to go back a little bit further, this is how we all, everything started, the creation started, as a singularity. We all came from that one dot, that one point. And all of our potential, all of our reality has come from that one spot. And I'm going to take us on a journey in 18 minutes and cover 18 concepts that will help you to deal with all the problems that you will face, answer the questions of who we are, what is our purpose, and how should we live. Not only am I going to give you those 18 principles, but every one of you should be able to comprehend what I've said. And every one of you should be able to give back those 18 principles and to be able to apply it. And tomorrow, when I see you in the hallway and I ask you, <laughs> you will be able to recite them. Not only will you be able to do that, but we're going to do that immediately after my presentation. So next week, when you go back and you said, what happened at the conference, you will be able to give all of these 18 points. Are you ready? <laughs> is, is somebody ready to time me? It's now 5.16. What time should we be done? 5.34. Begin. We start here with this. Each one of us starts with that one cell. The first part of us to develop and the first part of our potential reality and our identity is our body. We all have a body. That's what we identify. With that, we, we all first become bodies. Those bodies actually we share in common with an animal. So really, our body is our animal nature. It's what we call the lower nature. It's also our physical nature.
everything we do the first few months of life really is coming from our body. We do have a mind, we do have a soul, but that has not yet developed. The next thing that will develop is our minds. So we go on this journey, we're going from this spot, and we're all progressing. So, so far, everybody is with us. We, everybody knows they have a mind, and that part is actually what makes us human, and it is called our mental reality. Now, the last thing, potentiality, we have out here is our soul. It is what makes us divine. And it is our spiritual reality. All you need to remember is you have a body, which is easy. You see that? You have a mind. It's easy. We have a soul. That gets a little bit harder. But we all have a soul. Now, we have, so these are our three basic powers that we are born with. We have physical power. We have mental power. We have spiritual power. We also have three potentials that every human being has been given. We have the potential to know. We have the potential to love. And we have the potential to will. We can use these potentials for good or for evil. We can as we develop through our bodies and our minds and our souls, we develop our capacity to know love and will. We know with, we know with our body, we love with our body, and we will with our body. We know with our mind, we love with our mind, and we can will with our mind. We also can know and love and will from our soul. We are a journey from here moving outwards on this. Now these three capacities, these three potentialities lead to our purpose. We have three powers, three potentialities, and three purposes. And for me, that purpose relates to God. Now, if you don't believe in God, you can put the good here, a higher power, whatever. But our purpose, ultimate purpose, is to know God, to love God, and to submit our wills to God, which would be like uh, obey God, or to serve God. There are many different words you can use here depending on how you are describing it. So with our three potentials of knowing, loving, and willing, we can know, love, and will God. Now all of those lead to three guiding principles in life. These three principles are the ones that you can look to to decide how you should behave and to know with how you should live. In terms of knowing, that potential deals with truth. In terms of loving, the high principle that you're shooting for is unity. And in terms of will and obedience, the principle you're looking for is justice. These are the three guiding principles in life. They are the principles which you can make any decision using them. Now, as we are here in the Netherlands, and I come from the United States originally, 
we always associated the Netherlands with windmills. And so what I'd like to use is very quickly a model of what now has the new windmill, the wind turbine. These become like the spokes on a wind turbine. So many of us, when we're in that body phase and we, we develop our potentialities through here, we are able to know love and will in a very babyish kind of way. It's kind of like a pinwheel. It's fun to look at, it's very entertaining, but it really can't do much. As you move out on all of these capacities, you develop greater ability to interact with your environment, to use your knowing, loving, and willing capacities to actually generate energy like these huge wind turbines. So as you move from the body to the mind, your knowledge, love, and will grow. As you move into the soul, it moves into a whole nother exponential level. Now, I want to give you six practices that will help you to be able to move from your level wherever you are on this particular spoke out further. These are daily practices you should do every day. Just in the same way you developed your body and your mind by training them, this is going to train your soul. And this is ultimately your purpose in life. Another purpose, besides knowing loving God, is to prepare your soul for its true reality. Because we identify with our bodies and minds, but our true identity is our soul. So there is an acronym that we're going to use to spell, to remember these six. And that acronym spells out the word PRISMS. So what do you think these six daily practices would be? These are the first initial for each one of them. What would? Pray. pray. We should pray every day. Read. We should read the scripture every day. This one I actually have played with, so it made prisms. In the Baha'i writings, they use T. I use in my talks with I, when I give this talk to non-Baha'is, because I give this to university professors and as teachers. Teaching the cause is not one of the things. And so I use instruct. In the Baha'i writings, you would say teach. What would the S stand for? Service. Service. M, meditate, and the last one's a little harder. Sleep. What was that? <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> what? Study? No, that goes up here and here. No, it's, it's, here we go, S, strive. We have to strive every day to bring our lives in accordance with the principles of this God, our good, are the principles of truth, unity, and justice. So how much time do we have left? Six minutes. All right, I want to explore these a little bit more because not only are you have to do these six, but there are certain instructions these come from that you need to abide by. Now, these instructions all come from a 1983 September 1 message of the Universal House of Justice. It was actually written to Norway, for those people here from Norway. And in there, the House of Justice was helping them. And they said, Baha'u'llah's writings, and actually, I'll read you the very sentence that they give. Baha'u'llah has stated quite clearly in his writings the essential requisites for our spiritual growth. These are stressed again and again by Abdu'l-Bahá in his talks and tablets. One can summarize them briefly in this way. The first one is to pray, but they say you should pray 
the obligatory prayer. And they give you special instructions for doing that. And that is to pray with a PhD. <laughs> Pure, hearted, devotion. So every day you need to say your obligatory prayer with pure hearted devotion, with a PhD. <laughs> Every day you have to read. You read in the morning, in the evening. You read the sacred scripture, whatever your sacred scripture is. And they say you need to read with art. Any guesses what those might stand for? Attention, Attention is A. Reverence is R. Thought is T. So attention, reverence, and thought. Service is to serve God and to serve humanity through your calling and your profession. And when they talk about service, they say it needs to be selfless. And we will talk a little bit about that if we have a little more time. How much time more? We got another minute, because I, I distracted you at the beginning. You got five. OK, five minutes? <laughs> you distracted me? OK. <laughs> meditate. So when you meditate, they also give instructions. And you should meditate on the cuff. <laughs> so. They, you should meditate to convey, to understand, and to fulfill what you've read and prayed and thought about more faithfully. So you convey, understand, and fulfill faithfully. Now, you get extra credit if you get the red ones. <laughs> but you do need to all know the six, the prisms. Strive is to strive basically every day. One of the first things you can do to strive is to strive to be more truthful, to be more loving, and to be more just. Now, I want to suggest this model will serve to solve any problem that you will face. You can apply this for any situation you deal with, and one of these 16 constructs will affect. So very briefly, as a group, we're going to go over those 16. So the first one was the powers. What are our three powers? We have a body, mind, and soul. Well, getting a little excited here. Then we have three potentials. What are they? To know, to love, and to will. We have three purposes. Which is fairly simple, because it's to know, love, and will God. So you just go back here. Or if you want to put good. Then we have three principles. And what are they? What are the three principles? Truth, Truth, Truth unity, unity, and justice. How many know them all? Anybody can do all 16, you think? Because then you have to do this six. This is 12, 16. All right, I want you to take one minute, turn to your neighbor, see if you can say them without looking at the board. One of you tell the other, what is your purpose? What is it? Tell your neighbor right now. This is six. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 
that is 18 minutes. Now we're answering, I'm, I'm going to go back and look at these questions, and then I'm going to look at the second part where they said, once you have the answers to these questions, then you need to apply them to everyday problems, and that's what I want to do with the rest of our time. Did you mention the instruct teach part? The instruct teach part basically is to teach the cause of God. There's no instruction about that. And again, as I give this presentation often to non-Baha'i audiences, I don't use teach. I use instruct partly because it fits prism better, but partly because it's instruct. I, I am an educator. I often talk to educators. So part of the instruct, when I talk to them, you need to be instructing just like you are doing one another right now. You need to instruct others how to know love and will using their body, mind, and soul to come to know God and apply the principles of truth, unity, and justice. So that's what the teaching is about. You basically need to kind of teach in this way. So what, who we are, we have body, minds, and soul. So I want you to play with that just a little bit because it's, it's important to know we just think we are we, but we don't discriminate that we have different identities. We have different natures. Now, you are looking at me, and you can see that you are not me. Now, I affect your life. It may make you more pleasant. It may make you unpleasant. It may be like a meal. You could, you could tell your body, I'm not enjoying this, and get up and walk out. You, you don't. This is not who you are. But I do affect your life right now. I affect how you're, how you're feeling. I affect what you're thinking. I'm affecting what you're, what you're doing. Now, every one of you also has a body. And that body is also talking to you. It's telling you what to think, or know, love, and will. But you don't have to listen to that body in the same way you don't have to listen to me. You could just space out. Your body may be saying, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm uncomfortable. But your mind is going to say, oh, OK. We'll, you'll, you'll be able to get relief. It's only going to be a little bit longer here. No problem. You also have a mind. And now this is where it starts getting tricky. Your mind is also telling you things. They're telling you things like, this guy is a little kooky, or maybe this makes a lot of sense, or whatever. But your minds are also communicating something to you, that self that is in you. And again, you will listen to your mind. We have not grown to that stage where we won't listen to our minds. But you also have a soul. And I am communicating to you with my body, you're seeing me. You're hearing me. I'm vibrating the air. I'm communicating with your mind. You are interpreting. You're using all of your spiritual faculties, which the Baha'i writings say you have the faculty to imagine. You're imagining this. You're thinking about it. At some level, you are comprehending it. And at another level, you are memorizing. You're remembering it. All of those are four of the five spiritual faculties we have. The fifth one is the common faculty, which is that faculty you're using to process all of this. So you're using all of those faculties. So we are communicating with the mind, but we're also communicating with the soul. Your soul is having some sense of whether this sounds right, whether this rings true, whether this person is promoting unity, is, is I feel oneness with this person, whether this person is being fair. Or you might use different language. For instance, this knowing is really our a capacity to think. And this loving really is our capacity to feel. And this willing really is our capacity to do our act. And so 
you use all of those capacities. Now, those capacities have potential for good or for evil, as I told you earlier. As you move out on these scales, you are, you are getting a more positive influence. Your ability to influence yourself and your environment goes up. As you move down on this, move into your body, get more directed, what you begin to react to what your body is telling you to do rather than what your soul is telling you to do, or if you want to go higher, what God is telling you to do. As you move out, you are developing greater capacity, greater potentiality. And that potentiality is like this wind turbine. As you get stronger, you can deal with more tests. The greater the winds come to you, they aren't going to blow you over. They're actually going to create more energy for you. You're going to welcome those tests and those problems because that's what's going to cause your soul to develop. And you're going to want to be around those people because those people who have that are going to generate that in you as well. And you begin this process of what our real purpose in life is to have this thing spin. What happens is most of us are out of balance. Some of us are all about thinking. Oh, I want these ideas and such. So this, this one here gets really big. But their loving capacity, oh, maybe not so bad. Maybe they're willing a little here. So that's not going to spin very well. Part of the answer to your happiness and your well-being is to have these things in balance. And so you need to do a little self-reflection to see, am I, do I need to develop more of my loving capacity or my willing capacity to balance out my thinking capacity? So as you do this, you are having greater impact and greater transformation both inwardly and outwardly. So with that, the last thing I want to talk about are these three principles, and then I want to open up to questions. Because I'm going to suggest, whenever you get to a problem, there's three things you can ask yourself. So one of the things you want to ask yourself is, am I being truthful? And most of us aren't truthful. We are following what our body and minds tell us, and we think that's true. But what's true is really out here. These do have some level of truth. Yes, you are hungry, but no, you shouldn't steal somebody else's food. These truths out here are higher truths. And, these are the, and this love out here, so here is a very... Uh, animalistic kind of love, we all have that. So when people talk about, well, we're all animals, yes, we are all animals. But that's not the end of the story. We are all also humans that have a mind that controls that animal part of us, that can choose to listen to our animal instincts and desires or choose to do something else. But one of the problems with our minds is our minds tend to be egocentric and ethnocentric. And so what we think is true, what we think is loving or unifying, and what we think is just is very much conditioned on how we were taught. And so if we were given prejudiced ideas, we will do the wrong thing. And so there is actually a formula. I'm not going to apply it here. But for those people who like mathematics, this formula is k times l times w equals v. So the amount of your knowing, loving, positive knowing, loving, willing will equal the value of any act you do in this world. 
So if you have three positive, if you are, let's say, truthful, unifying, and just, then you're going to have a positive outcome. But let's say one of these is negative. For those who like mathematics, let's say it's not a truth, it's a falsehood that you love and you act upon. What will the value be? Negative. negative. What if it was two negatives? <laughs> that becomes a positive. What if you have a falsehood that you hate and you act upon that? It would be a positive result. And so uh, for those people who don't like math, just ignore that part. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open it up to comments and questions. Uh, we know who we are. We know what is our purpose. We know how we should live. Now we need to apply the answers to our everyday problems. So if anybody wants to, I'd like you to think in your mind just for a second, any everyday problem that you might be able to solve with this. And then I'm going to ask you to take one minute or two minutes with your neighbor again to see if this model can help you to solve that problem, if it gives you some insights, if it helps you to diagnose what the problem is, and then apply the solution. So take a minute, talk with your neighbor, think about it, OK? We don't have much time. I just want to stop you and see, does anybody want to share one of those problems? And we'll do this exercise as a large group, and then you can try it later on your own. Anybody want to present a problem? We don't find anything in our house. You can't find something in your house. All right, so first of all, you, you, have, you have your body, mind, and soul. This, this model is generally used to solve higher problems. So, <laughs> yes, yes. So one of the things you have to analyze, is it a problem with your body? Is it a problem with your mind? Is it a problem with your soul? I'm not sure. So, OK, you don't know. But, that's one of the ways you can analyze it. The second is, is it a knowing, loving, or willing problem? So in other words, is it a problem with your mind? Is it a problem that you don't care? Or is it a problem that you, you're not trying? Yeah, I think it's a knowing problem. Yeah, I think it is probably. Trying, a... trying every day. And so with that knowing, then, partly is being truthful. It's being truthful with yourself that oh, it's not my keys are bad and they're hiding, it's that I am having lapses. I need to now construct. I use, need to know my will, use my will to construct and I, a way that this is not going to keep happening because I'm wasting my time and it doesn't make me feel good. And so you begin to apply that and you can solve the problem. Thank you. You have good luck. <laughs> Somebody else want to try? Yes. So I am arguing a hypothetical argument with my brother. Yes. Because I reckon that this kind of model would work really well for people's health because it's about... Exactly. Right? Now you're getting into more where this twirly-whirly... Yeah. Can you start, can you repeat? Her, her, she is having a problem with her brother. Yeah, So, yeah, let's just, let's just leave it at that. Let's not go any further. So here's, here's what I would do with your brother. The first thing to say, and to do with you, the first thing to say, to say, what is the truth? See, most problems come up with your idea of the truth is different than my idea of the truth. And so we're saying, uh, no, you should do this. Uh, oh, no, you should do that. Or this is right, and that's wrong. This is good, and that's bad. The, the question you should be asking yourself, number one, is what is true? Not, let's say, Brexit, if that's a hot topic. Is, is what they're saying true? Is what they are saying loving? Is what they are saying just? And 
if they can't, and if they, you can't get a positive on these three, you're in trouble. But if you can't get a positive even on one of them, you're going to be in trouble. So most people will say, well, I'm truthful, and you're ugly, or you're bad. See, that may be truthful, but what is it missing? Loving. It's definitely missing loving. Or I may say something, and I may be missing the whole idea of justice. I'm not being fair to you. And so if you, part of the problem is, is most of us operate using one of these, and sometimes we're talking truth to somebody who's interested in justice or who's interested in relationships and feeling. And so you have to keep all of those in mind. And in fact, most religions tend to focus on one of these three spokes, and that's where they also get off balance. Some are, you are, you're a good believer if you believe the system. Others are, you're a good believer if you love, if you have that love and you feel that love from your savior. The others are, no, it is about what you do. And so they, they put salvation on one of these three spokes. You need all three of them. You need all three to have a balanced and a happy life. And so we all have our biases we tend to favor one of these over the other. And as we practice these, it helps us to move into the soul. Because the soul, with, with our mind, we can kind of look at our body and say, OK, body, you want this. But mind is saying, no, you're not going to have this. Our soul can actually look at our mind and say, no, those thoughts aren't very helpful. Forget about that. God is going to take care of you, or whatever. You're able to think in a whole spiritual level. When you move out on these things, you're moving. And now everybody in the world, the, the place the world, not only are we as individuals moving out on this as we mature, but as a race, as a whole civilization, we're moving out on all of these. And as a civilization, we're somewhere in here of ethnocentricity, which in human life is usually the adolescent stage. So humanity is kind of an adolescent stage. They're very much in their mind. They're very much believe their belief. They, they've gotten out of the egocentric. They still are egocentric, but they can't be egocentric within their culture because they, if they, even if they are, they have to look ethnocentric. And so they adopt these kind of values. The next level that Baha'u'llah is going to move civilization to is beyond ethnocentric to world-centric. And that process is happening right now with all the globalization. We are moving from an ethnocentric focus as a civilization to a world-centric. But what I am talking about to you is a much more revolutionary and life-changing change. It's not. Moving from ethnocentric to world-centric is going to happen whether you wish it or not, whether you make any effort or not, you're going to become more world-centric. That's happening. But you have to make an effort to develop your soul. You have to make that choice. You have to use your will. You have to use your knowing and your loving capacity to move into that soul development. And so I hope this model, you'll find it useful. I hope you'll be able to apply it. And if you want any more kind of information, um, you can Google my name. I have, uh, I have a compilation with over 500 pages of writings that support this model. This is what I've done over the 50 years, is try to boil it down into the simplest, most powerful a combination that is memorable and useful. I think you will find it can change your life, but it has, it has to be applied. It has to be applied daily. It has to be applied one problem at a time, one situation. And as you grow, you're going to gradually move into this soul capacity, which is a whole different world. It's, it's, it's different from being in this animal state to the mind state. You are, you are a new creation, and I wish that for all of you.
So thank you for your time. Sure, of course. What is the letter again? What's the, what's the date? Uh, it's the one September 1983 letter. Is the letter that has the six, the prisms in it. And the three questions are actually, it's in the 1974, but it's in the uh, two of the quotes. The, uh, the 18 January 19 gives the same three questions. The House of Justice. And it, isn't, and it isn't just in those two messages. Once you start studying the writings and go back into Baha'u'llah and into Abdul Baha's writings, you're going to find these questions come up again and again. And if you're like me, when I was 13 years old, growing up on a farm in a non-religious family, a non-educated family, I remember sitting out in the field thinking, who am I? What is my purpose? And how should I live? Those were burning questions to me. And that set me on the search to eventually become a Baha'i. So. Uh, Karen is how many Sorry, people grew up in a farm in Iowa? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Just, no, it was just a joke. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you're like me and you grew up on a farm, Uh, this model has been, as I say, it's been developing over 50 years. I'm just going to give you this part, how I came up with this. I was at, an, uh, I was speaker at a conference in Atlanta, Georgia, probably 40 years ago at the American Educational Research Association. In the evening, uh, I met with the Baha'is. We had a group of Baha'is come over to the a house, uh, and uh, we were talking about a new educational model, and we were all very excited as Baha'is get, we're going to change the world, we have this model and such. And I was staying with a family. The wife was African American, the husband was uh, Persian, who I'd met when I lived in Africa, and uh, they happened to have a item in their yard called a twirly squirly. I don't know if you know what that is, but the, the wife was a big lover of birds, and the birds would always, their bird feeders would get attacked by the squirrels. So she had gone and bought for $12.95 three sticks that joined on a dowel that they tie, put into the tree, and they put an ear of corn or maize at the end of each one. So the squirrel would climb the tree, come out on one of these, try to get that ear of corn, and the thing would fall. The idea is it would drive the uh, squirrel crazy, but it actually drove the husband crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the squirrels had no problem. They got right around it and found their way. But this was a bit a source of tension in the family. So the morning, and this is when I do most of my thinking in the morning I woke up and uh, I was thinking you know about the model we had this great conversation and of course this comes into my head and I said oh I've got it because we, you know, we had the model but we needed kind of a logo and I said oh it'll be the twirly squirly and this one will stand for knowing this will stand for loving and this will stand for willing and I thought wow that's great and I kept working with it. And over the years, I've just kind of evolved with that. So every time I'm reading, every time I give a talk, I gave a talk uh, two weeks ago on this. I went home that night, and things got rearranged. This is, this, I've never presented this before. So this is kind of a new structure. And so each time I do it, I hope I get inspiration. I try to have a pure heart myself, and hopefully it gets refined. And people ask me a question, and I say, oh. And it's like, oh. And I, I get the answer. So that's a short answer. It, it takes a long time, but I don't want to take any more time in this. Thank you. 
want to compliment you on the beautiful model. Thank you. Uh, the form you have is uh, quite amazing. Um, I was thinking about that because you've worked it out, which is always a surprise for me in the Baha'i community that people come up with ideas, which I think some of them are very old and some of them are surprisingly new. Um, in psychiatry, uh, it is very well known that uh, if the balance between thinking and acting and feeling is not correct, yes. then all the trouble happens. Exactly. And, um, but putting it into the spiritual part, because a lot of the imbalance for people with psychiatric problems yeah. is curing by the way of uh, referring to the higher power. Yeah. And whatever you call the higher power is not important in this matter, not yeah. in psychiatry. Yeah. But it, it really um, baffles me how beautiful the puzzle links together. That's and, it, and, I, and I try to make it as simple as possible for me. So I, if I can understand it, then probably other people can understand yeah, it. It's, so. yeah, it's and, and I also, I have a master's degree in psychology. And so I have, in some of the talks, I speak at universities or graduate schools on psychology. And I will talk about how these relate to the cognitive, affective, cognitive domains and how they, what, what the psychological literature says about these things. And so I think it's, it's simple, it's powerful. I think you can use it in your life. It's memorable. I'm going to test you tomorrow. When you see me, <laughs> if I see you running, I'm going to know you did too. But I think without even trying, you should be able to do them. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm shaking. My soul is so excited. Wonderful. <laughs> um, as a yoga practitioner, this is like ancient wisdom yeah. and knowledge, and you've just yes. like updated to the 9.0 version, yeah. which is so beautiful. And maybe tomorrow morning, for those of you who join us in yoga, we might explore some of this. But essentially, in Hatha yoga, the essence exactly. of yoga exactly. is the sun and the moon. The mm -hmm. sun being the root chakra or the grounding, the yeah. survival animalistic instincts, and the moon being your crown yeah. chakra, your exactly. spiritual being. And this exactly. is just so, so brilliant. Yeah. I just, yeah. I you you, so you could map the chakras out on here if yeah. you wanted. But you could also map the, the different yogas on here. There is the yoga of the mind. Yeah. There is the yoga of the Action. body. Yeah. yeah. And so... You'll find, I have, a, if you go online, I do have a number of papers. One paper, I have like 30 different comparisons of what knowing, loving, and thinking look like in different philosophies, psychologies, uh, different religions and histories and such. I think over here and somewhere else. Thank you so much for this, it's really helpful. I wanted to ask, suppose you have this um, family argument, hypothetical, whatever it is, situation, yeah. and you apply this, and the person that you're applying it to, the brother or the mother, whatever, is not receptive. And so you don't sort of get the response that you need, the problem still exists, because yeah. they're not coming from the same place. Yeah. And they just come back to you, yeah. and then you try again, yeah. And they're like just blocking it. Yeah. Like practically, you yeah. know, if I if I want to have a difficult conversation with my mother in a loving way or yeah. my brother, and they're yeah. not hearing it, do you do you have? Yeah, I do have a good uh, have I've done lots of those conversations. Okay. I was uh, head of a school of education. I had to counsel many students and many faculty, and sometimes you had to have very difficult situations that you had to talk about because some people weren't making it, some people weren't doing their jobs. And one of the ways that I always tried to start those difficult conversations is to say, I care about you. And therefore, I, I want to tell you something that may be hard to hear. But because I love you, it's important that you know this because you are hurting yourself and you are going to affect your life if you don't become aware of this problem. And so once you start, and, and when you have difficult conversations, I always try to start with love. If they don't know you care about them, forget it. 
you're, you're not going to have a conversation. So, the, and I always talk in terms of principle. I don't say you're a bad person. I say the truth as I understand it. And quite honestly, my truth is limited. I know I don't know the truth, but here's what, how, what I'm seeing, and I want you to help me see if there's something I'm not seeing. But the truth is, I see this. Now, do you see something different than I'm seeing? And so you're having a conversation about truth. It's not about they're good or they're bad. It's about what is true, and you are trying to ascertain truth because one of the things you have to know is you do not know the truth. You know your level of the truth, and your truth is affected by your body and your mind. And until you can get into that soul part, and that's where you need to be doing this work, you always have to know your truth is limited, and you have to hear their truth. And so when I was dealing with people, you know, we, I, have, I remember I had a faculty member who came in and said, well, this faculty member did this thing. And I said, OK, first of all, how do you know that's true? Well, the students came and told me. They told me she said this about me in class. And I said, well, is it possible the students maybe were not being truthful, or maybe they heard some, they interpreted it differently. And so, I mean, the first thing I did, and then I said, well, here, I, uh, this faculty member's in her office. I picked up the phone. I said, listen, did you say this about this faculty member in your classroom? Because I told the faculty, <clears throat> there will be no backbiting in this school. No backbiting. No backbiting, gossiping about other people. If you say something bad about it, you are going to be challenged about it. And you're going to be challenged immediately. So as soon as I heard this, while this lady was in front of me, I got on the phone and I said, is this true? And she said, no. What I said was this. <laughs> now, the students may have interpreted that. and. So immediately, by just asking the question, what is true? Because people have different ideas of truth. And so he said this, he hurt me, he did that. Is that true? So that's the first question I often work with. And then I said to her, OK, uh, so w let's say that was, it was true. Then I would say, what's the fair thing that we should do? For instance, faculty member, I was in charge of all the money. They would come and say, well, I've got this great project. Could you give me the money for it? And I would say, I'd love to help you. You know, it sounds like I see how this would be a good project. But my job as the administrator is to be fair to everybody. So I need to, I, because I'm going to be truthful, because they will come and say, well, you don't have to tell anybody. Just give me this money. And, you and I will know it, and we'll do this good. You don't have to tell me. I said, yeah, but that's not the way I work. I'm going to be truthful. You know that. And if somebody else comes, I'm going to be truthful of what I've done. So I'm going to have to tell them why I gave you the money, and I didn't give it to somebody else. So why is this fair? Because I care about you, but I care about all the other faculty. And so I have to be fair. And many times people walk out feeling quite good that they didn't get the money because they were doing the fair thing. And so once you appeal to principle and get out of personality, don't focus on the mind and the body. Look at the soul. Look at the soul of that person and see how can you react with them that their soul is going to grow. You're not there to make them happy. You're there to help them realize their purpose in life. And that's you're only going to do by actualizing those potentialities in a positive way. And as you do, they feel energy. They feel life. They feel happiness. And they wish to keep going in that way. So I'm very conscious of time. So. I, I, I defer to the administrators here. <laughs> they have to do justice. I'm going to do love and truth. 
They can do justice. I think maybe one question you were waiting already. All right. We call it. You know, I'm going to be here. I can talk to any of you in the hall at dinner time and lunch. Uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, we studied this afternoon in our group uh, um, the 18th of January letter. Yes. The House of Justice yes. 2019. Exactly. Uh, in which we, uh, we read that this is towards the end. It says, um, um, the power of implementation is speaking of Yes. This, which is the... This, the Including uh, one of the concluding paragraphs uh, is that is that pow the power of, is in this great endeavor is the penetrating influence of the Word of God exactly and the confirmations of the Holy Spirit. So the confirmations is uh, is the um, you're you're receiving the confirmation by doing these six practices every time you practice truth, love, or justice. You're getting confirmation. Every time you move out towards your soul, you're getting confirmation. Every one of those powers. And so to go back to the title of this, it's becoming the vanguard and champions of a new civilization. This is how you do it. You, and you become superpowers. You become superheroes. Because once you've moved out here, you've got access to powers that other people don't have because you're no longer trapped in your body and your ego. And so people have no power over you to say, oh, you're such a smart person or you're a good person, do this. No, you are operating from this place. And so your reward and punishment of the body and mind aren't influencing you. You're thinking about this, the reward and punishment of God. You are no longer controlled by your body or your mind you have submitted your mind, your heart, and your will to God. And that is who your true identity is. That's your purpose in life. That's who you are. You are not this. You are not this. This is all going to die. And it's going to die sooner for me than for most of you. And so I can be more detached about it because my whatever body and mind I have is going. And that's fine, because that's not who I am. Who I am is here, and that's going to live forever. That's my true immortal identity, and that's where I stop. Thank you. Thank you.